Now this is the account of the first city of men and of kingship on earth. Now, very interesting how those things go hand in hand. The Anunnaki playing a hand in being uh, setting up the first city of men on earth and then also setting up kingships. And that's, uh, that's what I've been trying to tell people here for, here for four years on the show now is that, and it's an absolute fact if you do the research, the idea of kingship and the divine right to rule and all of this stuff, and it's very much alive in today's uh, politics and today's rulers and leaders. All of that, the whole idea comes that comes of that goes back to those families and those bloodlines who, who trace their uh, lineage directly back to these Anunnaki. And that's how the kingship and the thrones and all this stuff were set up on earth. So let's get into that here tonight. And how Marduk schemed to build a tower wherefore Inanna had stolen the M.E.s in the first region, in the lands of the Eden, and in the cities with precincts, by their Anunnaki lords, the earthlings were taught handiworks and crafts. Before long, the fields were irrigated, and on canals and rivers, boats soon sailed. The sheep folds and granaries were overflowing. Prosperity filled the land. Ki in Gi, land of the lofty watchers, the first region was called. Then to, the, to let the black-headed people, a city of their own possess, it was decided. Kishi, scepter city it was called. In Kishi did the kingship of man begin. Therein, in consecrated soil, Anu and Enlil, the heavenly bright... Uh, in, in, now, this is interesting. Therein, in consecrated soil, Anu and Enlil implanted the heavenly bright object. Now, isn't that interesting? So, in consecrated ground, Anu and Enlil are implanting some heavenly bright object into the ground here. Well, what could that be? Because whatever it is, it, that is... It has to do with kingship on the divine right to rule. Is this some ancient archaeological relic like the Ark of the Covenant? I don't know. In it, Ninurta appointed the first king. Mighty Man was his royal title. My, that was the best they could do, Mighty Man. Mighty Man, you are in charge. Run things for us here on this planet, Mighty Man. We trust you, Mighty Man, all the descendants of Mighty Man. <laughs> To make it a civilized center for mankind, Ninurta journeyed to Eridu. The Emmy tablets that for kingship divine formulas hold from Enki to obtain. Properly attired, with respect, Ninurta entered Eridu for the Emmy of kingship, he asked. Enki, the lord who all uh, who all the emmys who safeguards all the emmys granted 50 emmy to ninurta mitochondrial extractions dna to create new new workers new humans in kishi where the black headed people were taught to calculate numbers heavenly nisaba writing uh, writing taught them and heavenly ninkashi showed them beer making no, they showed how so beer came from aliens. Oh, all right, that's good to know. In Kishi, by, uh, guided by Ninurta, kiln work and smithing proliferated. Wheeled wagons harnessed to male asses, craftily fashioned in Kishi. Laws of justice and righteous behavior were promulgated in Kishi. It was in Kishi that the people composed hymns of praise to Ninurta. Sounds like the beginning of goddess worship right there, doesn't it? Of his heroic deeds and victories, they sang. Of his awe-inspiring blackbird, they chanted. I think it's interesting that they had this craft, you know, Ninurta has this craft called the blackbird, this, you know, this ship that flies around, looks like a blackbird. Could that be, could that be where we got the technology for the 
SR-71 Blackbird. I mean, look at that. Look at that plane. Look at the SR-71 Blackbird. Think about that thing. They admitted they had that thing in 58, which means they had to have been working on it prior to 58, if 58's when they admitted they had it. Yet this is long before computer-aided design and, and engineering and any of this stuff, yet they were able to calculate properly how to have this plane operate without a vertical fin stabilizer. It has two small fins in the back, but no vertical fin stabilizer. And I've seen documentaries talking about the SR-71 Blackbird where they're talking about, you know, that, and they, but they never seem to mention that, yeah, they didn't, you know, you would have had to have computer-aided design and all that stuff to get that right. How are they able to get that right? We went from flying, you know, prop planes just a few short years earlier in World War II to having, you know, this supersonic thing that can fly at the threshold of space in, in, in a matter of less than 10 years. So I find that interesting. I mean, could that SR-71 Blackbird come as a result of, you know, these ancient plans they found? Very well, we could have been. They've tried to retire those things so many times, but that they can't because there's still the stuff that's in them still surpasses technology we can produce today. The U-2 spy planes the same way. Why is that? Why is there technology in these things from 40, 50 years ago we can't recreate today? That's, that, that's a good question, isn't it? How in faraway lands the bisons were subdued and how the white metal was mixed with copper, he found. Ninurta's glorious time it was. With the constellation of the archer, he was honored. All the while, Inanna in the Unki, her lordship awaited in the third region. All the while, the domain of her own of the leaders she demanded. The third region after the second one will come, her leaders thus assured her. Having seen how Ninurta journeyed to Iridu, and how the EME of kingship he attained, Inanna devised a plan in her heart to obtain ME from Enki. She schemed. Her chambermaid, Ninurshber, she dispatched to Iridu to announce a visit by Inanna. On hearing this, Inky, Inky quickly gave instructions to his housemaster, Izamud, the maiden, all alone, to my city, is directing her step to Aridu. When all alone she will arrive, let her enter into my inner chambers. Uh-oh. You know what Inky's thinking. He wants to... Pour the semen in the womb. Pour it. Pour it into her open vagina. Pour the semen into her womb, and you. It is your, it is your destiny to pour the semen into the womb. Pour for her cold water to freshen her heart. Give her barley cakes with butter. Prepare sweet wine. And fill the beer vessels to the rim. Well, yeah. See, that's worked for thousands of years. It, all, it all works and always works. Get her drunk and then take her panties off. Yankee knows what's up, man. I mean, he knows the rules. He knows what, to, you know, he knows what he's got to do. He's a pimp. When Inanna was alone in the abode of Enki, entered, Izamud followed Enki's commands. Then when Enki greeted Inanna, he was overwhelmed by Anana's beauty. With jewelry, Anana was bedecked. By her thin dress, her body was revealed. When she bent down, her vulva, her vulva was thoroughly admired by Enki. I can't believe I just read that. When she bent down, her vulva was thoroughly admired by Enki. Oh, yeah, I like that vulva, baby. I can see it sticking out of your dress. Christ. So these, so we got Anunnaki going commando now, huh? Now, I like these guys. They're fucking Klingons all the way. These, they're fucking Klingons. These motherfuckers are hardcore. They're getting drunk, wearing no pants eyes. She's running. She's rolling in commando, dude. I mean, vulvas, dude, when you got vulva sticking out of your dress, I mean, 
come on now. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're pretty much asking for it there. I mean, you know, you, seriously, you're going to roll up, you're going you're gonna to come over to a dude's house. You're going to have alcohol. You're going to have a dress where you can see your vulva. And you're going to expect that this dude is not w- going to want to get his dick wet. I mean, come on. Give me a fucking break. You got, you got to be expecting that. Come on, ladies. You wouldn't roll over to a guy's house with a dress on with your vulva sticking out of it unless you were planning on getting some, would you? All right. Well, I'll keep that in mind. Next time I see a lady walk my way, if I see her vulva sticking out of her dress, it's on. That's all I'm saying. I can't believe it just read that. When she pent down, her vulva was thoroughly admired. Banky, like, looks like he's standing there, you know, stroking his, his goatee or stroking his beard, you know, admiring it. Oh, I see your vulva sticking out of your dress there. Oh, huh? well, I'm just admiring it. Don't, don't mind me. I just, I, I just want to stare at it. Ladies, you know you got a guy that's full of shit if he ever tells you that. Just, just saying. If a guy ever says, no, honey, I just, I just want to look at it. It's pretty. I don't I don't want to do anything to it. Bullshit. He's lying. You know that, or he's placed with with another team. I don't know. From the wine cups, they drank sweet wine, and they had a beer drinking competition. What? Dude, Anana is the shit. Rolling over to a homeboy's crib, fucking all with her shit hanging out and getting drunk. She's like, come on, bitch. I'll drink you under the table. Let's have a beer. They're shotgunning beers, and she's, you know, she brought the fucking beer bong from, from the Eden, and they're just getting there. Oh, that's, god damn, I mean, that, that, that's a way to a man's heart right there. I mean, seriously. The chick that would always walk into the party or walk into the bar and be like, I'll drink any man here under the table. I'd be like, you're going home with me. And no, you're not going to drink me under the table. <laughs> that's that's greatness. Show me the Emmys, Anana playfully said to Enki. Let me hold Emmy in my hand. Seven times in the course of the competition, Enki gave Inanna Emmys to hold. The divine formulas for lordship and kingship, for priesthood and scribeship. For love dressing and for warring, Emmys gave and not gave to Inky gave to Anana to hold. For music and singing, woodworking and metals and precious stones, ninety-four Emmys that for civilized kingdoms are needed, Inky gave to Anana. Holding her prizes tightly, Inana slipped away from Inky while he was slumbering. To her boat of heaven she rushed out. To soar away, she instructed her pilot. When Inki, from his slumber, was awakened by Izumud, he said to Izumud, get a hold of Inanna now. When from Izumud that Inanna had already in her boat departed, Inki heard. To chase Inanna in Inki's skyship, Izumud, he instructed, all the Emmys you must retrieve to him, he said. At the approach to Unuki, Izumud Inanna's boat of heaven intercepted. To return to Iridu and face the wrath of Enki, he made her. But when Inanna was brought back to Iridu, the Emmys were with her no more. She gave them to her chambermaid, Ninshubor, to the house of Anu in Unagki, Ninshubor took them. In the name of my power, in the name of my father Anu, I command you, the Emmys, to return. So Inki did angrily say to Anana, captive in his abode, he held her. When Enlil heard of this, he came to Eridu to face his brother. By right, the Emmys have I obtained, Inki himself, in my hand, placed them. So in, in, Inanna did say to Enlil, the truth of that, Inki meekly admitted. When the time term of Kishi shall be completed, to Unuki, kinship shall pass. So Enlil did declare. When Marduk heard all of this, 
He was greatly enraged, and his anger knew no bounds. Enough, my humiliation has been, Marduk shouted to his father Enki. <coughs> A sacred city of his own in the Eden he forthwith demanded from Enlil. When Enlil paid uh, no heed to Marduk's appeal, Marduk grasped his fate in his own hands. To a place that for Anu's arrival before Unikki was selected was considered. Nabu, the Agigi, and their offspring from the dispersal lands were summoned. For Marduk, therein a sacred city, a place for sky ships, was established. When his followers assembled at the place, stones to build with they did not find. Marduk taught them how to make bricks and burn them by fire to serve as stone. Therewith a tower whose head the heavens can reach, they were building. To thwart the plan, Enlil hurried to the place to placate Marduk with soothing words. To, start, to stop Marduk and Nabu in their endeavor, Enlil did not succeed. In the Biru Key, Enlil, his sons and grandchildren were assembled. What to do, they all considered. Now listen to this. This, this, this is very interesting, and this ties into some of the work I'm, I'm research I've done into Stargates and uh, how that ties into ancient archaeological pieces found in ancient Iraq and Mesopotamia, exactly where this is taking place at, by the way. And this is very interesting because it says Marduk is building an unpermitted gateway to heaven and entrusting it to earthlings. So it, it sounds to me like Marduk is, is setting up a stargate that he's allowing earthlings to have knowledge of. Now that's true to me. That 100% explains why the first place we went in in 2003 during the invasion of Iraq was the Iraq National Museum to get all these antiquities that pertain to uh, the Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian empires. So that, that's where we see the problem here. Okay, so Marduk was getting ready to open this stargate, and they were having trouble because he was in, you know, entrusting earthlings with the knowledge of this, and rightly so. So Enlil did say to his sons and his grandchildren, if we allow this to happen, no other matter of mankind shall be unreached. This evil plan must be stopped, Ninurta said. All agreed with that. It was nighttime when from Nibiru Key the Inlilite Anunnaki came. From their sky ships, they rained havoc and fire and brimstones on the rising tower. To the tower and the whole encampment, they brought a complete end to it. To scatter abroad the leader and his followers in Lil, thereupon decided. Henceforth, their counsels to confuse their unity to shatter in Lil decree. Until now, all the earthlings had one language and spoke in a single tongue. Henceforth, their language I shall confound that they will not understand each other's speech. Ah, well, why is that important? Why is it important to have, maybe does that explain the origins of language and why we've had different people speaking language, different languages? Does that somehow keep us as less of a threat? I don't know. In the 310th year since the count of Earth years began, all of this did happen. In each region and every land of the people had a different tongue that he made them speak. A different form of writing thereafter to each was given that one will not comprehend the other. Ah, see, covering tracks. Very clever. Not wanting people to know that people who brought knowledge and uh, technology and, and all this stuff and religion to people all over the different parts of the world, that way people in the future would be confused, much in the way modern science tells us now, 
And so that we wouldn't believe that all of these came from one group of people, we would think they were all separate. That's very clever. 23 kings did reign in Kishi for 408 years. It was the scepter city. It was also in Kishi that a beloved king, Itana, was taken for a heavenly journey. Now, that's an interesting thing, too, isn't it? That, that some of these kings that are humans are allowed to go to heaven or allowed to go through the Stargate and to go to Nibiru and come back. Isn't that interesting? At the allotted time, let the kingship to Unaki be transferred, so Enlil did decree. To its soil, the heavenly bright object from Kishi was transferred. When the decision was announced to the people, they sang a hymn of exaltation to Inanna, lady of the Emmys, queen brightly resplendent, righteous in radiance clothed of heaven and earth beloved, by the love of Anu consecrated, wearing great adorations, seven times the Emmys she obtained, in her hand she is holding them. For the tiara of kingship, they are appropriate. For high priesthood, suitable. Again, there's that mention that the priests have this power and that the priests were ordained with this power from the Anunnaki. Very interesting and very, very important in understanding the nature of the priest class and, uh, and, and, and what they do and, and how far it goes back in our day and age. Lady of the great Emmys, of them she is the guardian. In the 409th year, after the count of earth years began, kingship of the first region to Unagki was transferred. Its first king was the high priest of the Inanna temple abode, a son of Utu he was. As for Marduk, to the land of two narrows he went. To be the master of the second region once established, he expected so. They're sending Marduk off to another region yet again where he's expecting to be uh, reigning over. We'll see how that goes. Page 283, now this is the account of how the second and third regions were established and how Nigazida was exiled and Uneg Ki Arata was threatened. 283. When Marduk, after a long, a long absence, returned to the land of the two Narrows, he found there Ningazita as its master. Ningazita was its lofty lord. With the aid of offspring of Anunnaki, who earthlings espoused, did Ningazita oversee the lands. What Marduk had once planned and instructed was overturned by Ningazita. What is it that happened? Marnock demanded to know of Ningazita. Of the destruction of the hidden things, Marnock accused Ningazita of making Horon a desert place to depart, a place that now has no water, a bound to a boundless place where sexual pleasures are not enjoyed. The two brothers made an uproar, and they embarked upon bitterly quarreling. Pay heed, I am here in my proper place, Marduk said to Ningazita. You have been my place taker. From now on, only a deputy of mine you can be. But if to rebellion you are inclined to a land, another land, go away, you must. For 350 earth years, the brothers in the land of the two narrows did quarrel. These motherfuckers are fighting 350 years. For 350 years, the land was in chaos. Between the brothers, it was split. Then Enki, their father, said to Ningazita, For the sake of peace, depart to other lands. To go to a land beyond the oceans, Ningazita chose. With a band of followers, there too he went. 650 earth years was at that time the count. But in the new domain where Ningazita, the winged serpent, was called. The winged serpent. A new count of his own began. You don't think Ningazita was. Uh, 
the, the feathered serpent, the Quetzalcoatl, very well could have been. In the land of the two narrows, the second region under Marnock's lordship was established. In the annals of the first region, Megan, land of the Cascading River, it was called. But by the second region's people, when the languages were confounded, there's that thing about the language again. <coughs> Him ta, the dark brown land, it was henceforth called. The Teru, guardian watchers, the Anunnaki were called there in the new language. Ah, the Teru, the guardian, the watchers. So that's when they started becoming the watchers, huh? Now listen to this. Oh, they're talking about, I see. So they're not talking about uh, Quetzalcoatl here. Uh, well, no, I guess they could be because Ningazita went somewhere else. But Marduk, listen to this. Marduk as Ra was worshipped as the bright one. Inki as Ptah, the developer, was venerated. So when they moved to this new land, this new region, Ningazita went to a land where he was called the winged serpent or the feathered serpent, the winged serpent. So he went to probably Mexico area, South America. Uh, he, went out, he went to go build the rock wall in, in, in Rockwall, Texas. That's what I 100% I believe it to be now on the, on, based on the evidence of John Lindsay and people who looked at this. It's, it's Aslan. That's what it is. Uh, because Quetzalcoatl was said to have been a master of two things, alchemy and of uh, crystals. And those are two things that we found in, in, in the rock wall that are there. Uh, and a wheel, a composite wheel made of multiple different kinds of, kinds of metal smelted together. Only an alchemist could have done thousands of years before mankind had the ability to do that. I held it in my hand. And uh, the fact that the wall is held together by a substance made of crystals that has been made into geopolymers. Three, three different kinds of crystals, not indigenous to this area, brought together to make a polymer that holds the walls together. And yet mainstream science says it's a natural formation, but yet it's the only natural formation they've ever found like that in the world. Okay. And so he went there, and Marduk went to Egypt with Enki and the rest, and this is where we see the rise of Egypt. I love this because you know, this, this is where we're getting into, the, into being able to, to, for the confusion to stop, the people to stop thinking that there's some separation between um, and we're starting to see more and more. See, a lot of people are starting to send me a lot of emails and say, these, you know, the Anunnaki is still here. They've never left. They're still running the show. And, you know, I'm starting to see more and more evidence of that every day. That, uh, you know, they never left. And they are the explanation for why we hit this brick wall once we keep going up and up and up the power structure, looking at who's really in control. But once we get so far up, we hit a brick wall and can't really see where this other control is, many people, including myself, have speculated that it's coming from an, uh, you know, other dimensional source, and that very may, well, well may be a part of it. I think that is a part of it as far as their rituals and the stuff that they practice, but it very well could be that this power goes to a much larger source, and it's these Anunnaki that are still here. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of shit in China, man. I, I'm sorry, it, it, nothing against you if you're Chinese out there. I have nothing against Chinese people at all, but I have to say, China I, I, of all the places in the fucking world, if I was in charge, first fucking thing I'd do is send a neutron bomb into fucking China. Fuck China. God damn fuck China. They got pyramids and shit there, man, that, that, that were, you know, these giant pyramids that they're, they've planted trees on. Ancient pyramids. They've never allowed anybody to investigate. They won't allow anybody in there to check them out. And, you know, the, the Chinese people, they actually believe, like, no shit that their ancestor, their ancient ancestor, which seated on the Chinese people, was a fucking winged serpent. A, I'm not shitting you, a female dragon serpent thing with a female head, head that flew. And they say that all their descendants came from that. I'm not shitting you. They really believe that. And they've got areas in there that we can't get into, pyramids. We can't see that they're burying under trees that they've, they've, they've planted on top of it. They're covering up archaeological sites. Why? What's there? What are they afraid of? 
So this is interesting. Marduk is Ra, the bright one was worshipped. Enki as Ptah, the developer, was venerated. Ningazito as Tehuti. So Ningazito is Tehuti. Wow, that's, um, that's amazing. The divine measure was recalled to erase his memory. Oh, listen to this. So we heard earlier about it was Inanna. Was it Inanna that had... Uh, he carved the face of Anana into the stone lion. To erase his memory, Ra on the stone lion replaced his image with that of his son Asar. So that explains why the face of the Sphinx appears to have had modifications done to it. To count by tens, not by sixty, Ra made the people. The year he also divided by tens. The watching of the moon by the watching of the sun he replaced. Whereas under the lordship of Tehuti, the olden city of the north and the city of the south were reestablished. Well, this goes to explain, I mean, if this is what, if what they're saying is true, then I mean, this, that's it for me. Temple Hathor, Dendera, Luxor, the Great Pyramids. I mean, there's no, there's no question. Like, if you watch that documentary I was telling you about last night, the revelation of the pyramids, there's just no question that there was high technology made. And they've talked about the high technology they've used many times through these texts. I, I don't know how much more you need. Oh, all those symbols and all that stuff. That was all just, that was all just symbolic stuff. They, they're blah, blah. No, 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 no. I never believed that. Never believed that in school. I spoke up about that and got in trouble and got called names. And I'm so fucking proud of my past self. My future self, present self, is very proud of my past self for, you know, actually speaking my mind about that when I was in school and saying, you know what? I don't think that that's symbolic. <laughs> oh, you're a weirdo. You're an idiot. I never believed those things in Egypt or ancient Sumeria, all that stuff was, you know, was ever symbolic. <laughs> I don't know why I instinctively always just knew that, but I did. Now we're talking about real things that looked like that. Marduk, Ra, of the two lands of the north and south, united into one crown. A king and offspring of Neteru, an earthling, he there appointed. Mina was his name. Mina, as in Mina, Arkansas, where they where Leak shipped all the coke. Okay. Where the two lands meet and the great river divides, a scepter city raw established. Splendor to surpass Kishi in the first region he gave it. Mina Nafir, Mina's beauty it was called. To honor his elders, Ra built a holy city. To honor Nibiru's king, Anu, he named it. And also, also, here's another in your face. Also in your face of all those cocksuckers out there in Radio Land hosts and other researchers who tried to tell me for years that the Ankh from Egypt didn't have anything to do with the Anunnaki. The origins of your cross and all your religious symbology from the Pope's fish hat to his staff with his Ankh on the end of it. What do you think that is? It all goes back to the Anunnaki. Therein on a platform, a temple abode for his father, Inki Ptah, erected. Its head, within a high tower, rose skyward like a sharp rocket. In its shrine, Ra, the upper part of his celestial barge, he departed. So he put part of his fucking spaceship in one of these things in Egypt, huh? Well how, well, how long ago was it when we excavated the Great Pyramids? Well, that was, you know, in the expanse of history not a long time ago. They were buried in sand for years. There's more down there. Maybe that's what Zawas has been hiding all this time. Ben-Ben, it was called. It was the one in which he had traveled from the planets for countless years. On the day of the new year, the king as high priest performed the ceremonies. On that day only, alone, the innermost star room he entered before the Ben Ben offerings he put. To benefit the second region, Ptah to Ra, Ra 
gave all manner of MEs. What do I know that you do not know? The father asked his son. Then all manner of knowledge he gave to Ra, except that of reviving the dead. So there you go. So see, see now we had this evidence. We talked about this. Remember earlier in the book, we had the reading where uh, one of them was on Mars, and that was why they carved the face on Mars. And that area known as Cydonia, which also was where the cradle of civilization, also on the 33rd degree parallel, also known as Cydonia was. And that they had brought him back to life using this technology. Now we're starting to see what all of this life after death stuff and uh, mummification and stuff in, in, in Egypt was really about, aren't we? So he gave Ra, Inki gave Ra, or now Ptah, Inki is now taking the name of Ptah, gave all the knowledge that he had to Ra except that of reviving the dead. As a great one of the twelve celestials, Ptah allotted to Ra the constellation sign of the ram. And again, they mentioned earlier that the first, or earlier in the book, earlier in the week also, we read that the ram, Taurus, was the first sign that mankind entered into, the first age that mankind entered in, into when earth years started to be counted. The water flow of Happy, the land's great river, Ptah for Ra, regulated for his people. Abundance in the fertile soils quickly came, men and cattle proliferated. By the success of the second region, the leaders were encouraged. The third region they proceeded to establish. To make it a domain of Inanna, as she was promised, they decreed. So now we're going to the Indus Valley region where our great listener Zohar had sent us some stuff from. As befits the mistress of a region, a celestial constellation was assigned to her. Beforehand with her brother Utu, the station of the twins she shared. Henceforth, as a gift from Ninarshag, her constellation of maiden to Inanna was allotted. In the 860th year, according to the earth year count, Inanna was so honored. Far away in the eastern lands, beyond seven mountain ranges, was the third region. Zamush, land of 60 precious stones, in its highland realm it was called. Arata, the wooded realm, was in the valley of meandering, of a meandering great river. In the great plain, the people cultivated crops and grains, and, and herded horned cattle. There, too, were two cities with mud bricks that they built, with granaries they were filled. As by Enlil's decree required the Lord Inki, Lord of Wisdom. As for the third region, they devised a change of tongue, a change of language. A new kind of writing signs he fashioned for it. A tongue of man heretofore unknown for Arata, Enki with his wisdom, created. But the Emmys of civilized kingdoms for the third region, Enki did not give. Let Inanna, for what Unagki had obtained, share with the new region, Enki did declare. Enki said, bitch ain't getting no more of my shit. She done bust up in here and took all my shit. I'm not giving her any more. She can scrape up that shit the other bitch took and lost. She ain't getting no more shit from me. Inky's a pimp, dude. His pimp grip is hard. He just puts it down, dude. He goes around pouring semen where he wants to, comes back and says, bitch, better have my money. He's a pimp, dude, I'm telling you. In Arata Inanna, a shepherd chief appointed, akin to her beloved Demuzi he was. In her skyship from Unagki to Arata, Inanna journeyed over mountains and valleys. She flew. The precious stones of Zamush she cherished, pure lapis lazuli, with her to Unagki she carried. At that time, the king in Unagki was Imurkar, the second one to reign therein he was. It was he who expounded, expanded the boundaries of Unagki 
and Inanna was exalted by its glories. It was he who the wealth of Arata coveted. To be the supreme commander over Arata, he schemed. To Arata in Merkar, an emissary dispatched as a tribute to Arata's riches to demand. So we're, we're going to go ahead and need a cut, basically, is what they're saying here. Over seven mountain ranges, through parched lands and then soaked by rains, the emissary went to Arata. To the king of Arata, the demand words of Imenkar, word for word, he repeated. His language, the king of Arata, was unable to understand. Like the bray of a donkey, its sound was. <laughs> Can't understand a goddamn word. A wooden scepter was inscribed with a message. The king of Arata gave to the emissary. To share Unagki's emmys with Arata, the king's message was requested. As a royal gift to Unagki, grains were loaded onto donkeys with the emissary to Unagki. They went. When in Merkar, the inscribed scepter received its message in Unagki, no one understood. He brought it forth from light to shade. He brought it forth from shade to light. What kind of wood is this, he asked and then ordered to plant, have it planted in the garden. After five years, after ten years had passed, a tree grew from the scepter. A shade tree it was. What shall I do, in Merker, in frustration, asked Utu, his grandfather. With heavenly Nisaba, the mistress of scribes and writings, Utu interceded. On a clay tablet, his message to inscribe Nisaba in Markar and was taught in the tongue of Arata. By the hand of his son Bando, the message was delivered. Submission or war, it said. By Anana, Arata was not abandoned. To Unigki, Arata will not submit, the king of Arata said. In warfare, Unigki desires. Let one warrior meet one warrior in combat. Oh, a little mano y mano, huh? A little man to man combat. Better yet, let us peacefully let us peacefully treasure exchange treasure. Let Una Ki exchange its MEs for Arata's riches. On the way back, carrying the peace message, Banda fell sick and his spirit left him. His comrades raised his neck, without breath of life it was. On Mount Huram, on the way from Arata, to his death, Banda was abandoned. The riches of Arata, Unagki did not receive. The Emmys of Unagki, Arata did not obtain. Well, then where did they go? So he died, and they didn't get the riches, and they didn't get the Emmys. And in the third region, civilized mankind did not fully blossom. So that's the end there of the 12th tablet. We're now to the synopsis of the 13th tablet. Royal city sprout with sacred precincts for the gods. Demigod serves as kings and priests in palace temples. Oh, we're going to get into some demigod stuff next. So good stuff there. Man, oh, man, oh, man. This is just, reading this, it just gives you a whole new context on history. It does for me anyway. In the third region, civilized mankind did not fully blossom. What to Inanna was entrusted, she neglected. Other domains not granted to her, in her heart she coveted. When from Unigki, at the count of a thousand years, kingship was taken away. Who could foresee the calamity by the end or the next millennium? And who could have presented, prevented the disaster? That in less than a third of one shar, a calamity unknown would befall, who could foretell? By Inanna was the bitter end started. Marduk as Ra tangled with destiny. Marduk now becoming Ra, the rise of the Egyptian Empire. 
Ninurta and Nurgle delivered the unspeakable end with their own hands. Well, that's interesting. If they delivered the unspeakable ends with their uh, end with their own hands, why did the Assyrians have giant uh, depictions of Nurgle outside of their of their temples? That's kind of scary. Why was Inanna not satisfied with her granted domain? And why did she remain unforgiving to Marduk? Journeying between Unanki and Arata, Inanna was restless and ungratified. For her beloved Demuzi, she still mourned. Her love's unquenched desire remained. When she flew about in the sun rays, Demuzi's image she saw shimmering and beckoning. In the nighttime, in dream visions, he appeared. I will return, he was saying. The glories of his domain in the lard of the two, of the land, it says lard. That's obviously a misprint because they said it was the land of the two arrows. So I'm not going to say it was the lard of the two arrows, but two arrows. But that's what it says here on my copy. So uh, <coughs> the lard of the two arrows. The glories of his domain in the land of the two arrows to her he was promising. In the sacred precinct of Unigi, a house for nighttime pleasure she established. To this Ging Unu young heroes, on the night of their weddings, she lured with sweet words. Long life, a blissful future to them, she promised. She imagined that that they were her that they were her lover, Demusi. Each one in the morning in her bed was found dead. Uh oh. This bitch is running some fucking Black Widow shit now, isn't she? Jesus fucking Christ, she mates and she kills. It was at that time that the hero, Banda, left for dead, returned alive to Unagki. By the grace of Utu, of whose seed he was, did Banda return from the dead. A miracle, a miracle, excited, Inanna shouted. My beloved Demuzi came back to me. Now, wait a minute here. Back up just a second. Back up. What did we just read here? This, th th this bitch is going off talking about dreaming about Demuzi, and this, th this fool's coming in and visiting her in her dreams, right? She goes and lures in the, the Gigunu young heroes, young strapping young lads, has intercourse with them, closes her eyes and dreams she's getting pounded by Demuzi, bangs all these guys, they all turn up dead in her bed the next day, and then the next thing you know, uh, Demusi's coming back. So either one or two things are happening here. Either she's confused, confused, and she's been hitting the wacky tobacco a little bit too hard, and she's confused, and she thinks this fool is Demusi when he ain't, or she's sucking the life life force out of people, and uh, you know, bringing him back to life. This is bizarre. By the grace of Utu, of whose seed he was, did Banda from, from the dead return. A miracle, a miracle. Excited Inanna shouted, my beloved Demuzi has come back to me. <coughs> In her abode, Banda was bathed with a sash and a fringed cloak on him was fastened. Demuzi, my beloved, she called him. Oh, yeah, see, see she's confused. She thinks this fool is Demuzi, and, and he's not. Uh-oh. To her bed with flowers bedecked, she lured him. When in the morning Banda was alive with joy, Anana shouted, The power of not dying in my hands was placed. Immortality by me is granted. Then to call herself a goddess, Inanna decided, the power of immortality it implied. 
Nanar and Ningle, Inanna's parents, by her proclamation, were not pleased. Enlil and Ninurta, by Inanna's words, were disconcerted. Utu, her brother, was bemused. It is not possible to revive the dead, Enki and Anarshik said to each other. Well, see, that's funny because that's a lie. Because Enki sure knows that that's possible. That's Anunnaki technology. They have the, 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 the technology to do that. But they also said that they were not going to grant that technology and that knowledge to mankind, you see. In the lands of Ki Ingi, the people praised their good fortunes. The gods are among us. Death they can abolish. So the people said to each other. On the throne of Unigki, Banda, his father in Murkar, seceded. Lugal, great man his title was. The goddess Ninsen of Enlil Seed took him to be her spouse. The hero Gilgamesh was their son. On the throne of Unigki, Lugal Banda followed. As the years passed and Gilgamesh grew older, of life and death to his mother Ninsum, he spoke about the death of his forebears. Though of Anunnaki descended, he wondered, do gods die, he asked his mother. Shall I too, though two-thirds divine, as a mortal over the wall climb? So to her he said, as long as on earth you abide, the death of an earthling will you over will overwhelm you. So as long as they stay on Earth, they're dead. But if they go to another planet, they can live long. You think the elite running the show today and running all this space program stuff don't know that, folks? But if to Nibiru you shall be taken, long life therein you will attain. To take Gilgamesh aloft. And journey to Nibiru, Ninsun to Utu, the commander, appealed. Endlessly, Ninsun appealed to Utu. She pleaded day after day with him. Let Gilgamesh go to the landing place. Utu, in the, in the end, agreed. To guide and protect, protect him, Ninarsag, a double of Gilgamesh fashion. Just like that, huh? Just like that? All right, let me make you let me make you a clone real quick to protect you. Here you go. Yeah, we got a clone machine over here. Now that's interesting because to me that's what we see depicted in the Temple of Hathor at Dendera in Egypt. These giants standing next to regular Egyptians holding these big stone, these big like vessels, these big long round cylindrical objects that are creating material plane objects. They're, they show one depicting a snake with a, with a lotus bud coming out of it, and then it becomes the Uraeus. When you look at the relief down the line, they're showing how they can create genetic copies of, of, of anything, of any material uh, creature. And to me, that's exactly what they're describing here. I mean, this guy, just, you know, pop, here you go, to guide and protect you, we're going to give your fashion you a double. Here you go, it's a double of, of uh, Ninarshog. Here, take it, it's yours. Enkidu, as by Enki created, he was called. Enkidu. Enkidu. A, of a womb, he was not born. Blood in, was not in his veins. With the comrade Enkidu Gilgamesh, Enkidu traveled to the landing place with Gilgamesh. Utu oversaw his progress with oracles. At the entrance to the cedar forest, its fire-belching monster blocked their way. With trickery, they confused the monster and broke it to pieces. So there's some kind of, oh, see, see this is another interesting thing. There's fire-breathing dragons living back in these times. With the secret entrance to the tunnels of the Anunnaki, they found, by the bull of heaven, a creature of Enlil, they were challenged with deathly snort so right there again that's what they've talked about we've seen this is where the stories of uh you know things like the the pegasus and the the uh, centaur and the minotaur and all this stuff come from is that not only were they doing genetic manipulations and stuff with existing 
humans and, and stuff like that, they were making all kinds of strange animals as well. And it said that uh, that Saddam Hussein had back engineered something like this, these crazy crab monster things, and uh, that was what they were actually referring to when they were referring to weapons of mass destruction. It makes sense. I mean, that's right where, huh, I mean, Christ, he was getting ready to rebuild Nebuchadnezzar's palace. It's the heart of, of the area we're talking about right here, folks. To the gates of Unagki, the monster chased them. At the city's ramparts by Enkidu, it was smitten. When Enlil heard this, he cried with agony. In the heavens of Anu, his wailing was heard. For in his heart, Enlil knew well. Bad indeed was the omen. For having slain the bull of heaven to perish in waters, Enkidu was punished. Gilgamesh, having by Ninsen and Utu been instructed of the slaying, was absolved. Still, the long life seeking the long life of Nibiru, Gilgamesh was per permitted to proceed to the place of the chariots by Utu. After many adventures in the land of Tilman, he reached the fourth region. Through its subterranean tunnels, he proceeded in a garden of precious stones, the Sudra, he met. The events of the deluge, Gilgamesh related to Zisudera. The secret of long living to Gil Gilgamesh, he revealed. A plant in the garden's well was, gro was growing. Zisudera and his spouse said that it prevented them from getting old. Unique of all the plants on earth it was. By it, a man can regain full vigor. Man at old age is young again. That is the plant's name, Zisudera said to Gilgamesh. Man at old age is young again. Anybody know anything that's that, that you know, what that plant might be? We need to find some of that, don't we? Man at old age is young again. We need to get some more sleuths to figure that out. Anybody out there got any ideas? Figure out what fucking plant this is. Probably fucking wacky tobacco. It's probably marijuana. Man at old age is young again. Fuck yeah. Old conjure fires up a joint. His arthritis ain't going to be hurting. That's for damn sure. This is the plant's name, Zisidra to Gilgamesh said, a gift to Enki. With Enlil's blessing, on the Mount of Salvation, it was granted to us. When Zisidra and his spouse were asleep, Gilgamesh tied stones to his feet. He dived into the well, and he grasped and uprooted the plant of being young again. With the plant in his satchel through the tunnels, he hurried. To Unagki, he made his way. When he tired and was asleep, a snake was attracted by the plant's fragrance. The snake snatched the plant from the sleeping Gilgamesh and vanished with it. Oh, man, that, that's not symbolic, is it? He's asleep with the elixir for immortality, and the serpent rolls up and takes it. Womp, womp. Oh, no. Nothing symbolic there. Go back to sleep. Oh, my God. That's a, it's totally a metaphor for the, for the brotherhood of the snake, the brotherhood of the serpent. Mankind is seeking to take this stuff in secret, but man himself wanting to keep this from man so he could gain total control. That about brings us up to date right there, doesn't it, Johnny? Thank you. In the morning, when he discovered his loss, Gilgamesh sat and wept. To Unagki, empty-handed, he returned. As a mortal, therein he died. Seven more kings in Unagki after Gilgamesh reigned. Then its kingship came to an end. Precisely when the count of a thousand years was completed, it was. To Urim, the city of Nanar and Ningal, was kingship of the first region transferred. To all these matters that in the other regions were occurring, Marduk gave much heed. By Inanna's dreams and visions to Demuzi's domain, she was alluding. Ra was very disturbed. 
To counteract Inanna's schemes of expansions, he was determined. In the matters of resurrection and immortality, he found much to ponder. The thought of divine godship to him greatly appealed. To be a great god himself, he announced. By what to Gilgamesh in good measure and earthling was permitted? Ra was anger. But a clever way with the royalty of, loyalty of kings and people, he deemed it to retain. If demigods are shown the gateway to immortality, then let this apply to the kings of my region. So did Mardok in the second region, by the name Ra, known to himself, say these words. Let the kings of my region of Neteru be offspring to Nibiru in an afterlife journey. So did Ra in his realm decree. The kings were taught how to build tombs facing eastward. Well, there you go. The kings were taught how to build tombs facing eastward. Duh. So he's he's giving them the he's giving them how to telling them how to journey to the afterlife, how to how to how to gain immortality. To the priest scribes, a long book he dictated. It described the afterlife journey in detail. Yeah, that's that's the book of the dead. There it is. Bam. How to reach the Duat. And the Duat was a book, Egyptian book. The place of the celestial boats in the book was told. How to there, by a stairway to heaven, journey to the imperishable planet. To partake of the plant of life and to drink with satiation the waters of youth. Of the coming of the gods to earth by Ra, the priests were taught. There he is setting up the priest class. Gold is the splendor of life to them, he said. The flesh of the gods it is to the kings, Ra said. To make expeditions to the Amzu and the lower domain to obtain gold, he instructed the kings. When by the force of weapons, the kings of Ra did not conquer their lands, his brother's realms he invaded. Their ire he caused to arise and grow. What is Marduk up to, the brothers asked each other, that he tramples over us? They appealed to their father Enki. To Ptah, his father Ra, did not listen. To capture all adjoining lands, the kings of Megan and Mohula Ra directed. To be the master of the four regions with his heart's plan. The earth is mine to rule. So adamantly to his father, he said. And the next part is now, this is the account of how Marduk, and the, Marduk Supreme himself declared and Babili built. So Marduk, that's amazing. So he sets up shop in, in Egypt as Ra. And then trots up back over to Mesopotamia and sets up Babylon. Or Babili, as they refer to it here, that's amazing. So page 296, the top of 296, that means that, you know, that, to me, that answers the entire question of the thesis that William Bramley put forward with his book, The Gods of Eden. His question when he started researching that book and trying to find out the, all the things that he subsequently found out was the origins of war. Well, baby, I don't think it comes any more clearer than that. We only know war because the people who set up the first civilizations on this earth embedded war into our genetic memory and into our DNA because they were warring with each other over who was going to rule parts of the earth. And I think it's still very much going on today. And the citizens and the regular people who don't have access to the higher knowledge of the gods and the priests are just pawns and cannon fodder. As much today and as much in the days of the Egyptians and the Sumerians as they are now. So if, if we now know what's been the cause of this for all these years, we can now say no more. We're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to kill each other anymore. We're not going to have wars anymore at the expense of these quote-unquote gods or wannabe gods and these bloodline people who think they're in charge now. 
This is the reason why the war, the, the world is the way it is today and why we have the elite, the new world order and the Illuminati this running stuff. It's all because of this and these people and what they brought to us here. And we have become the byproduct of an industrialist species. We're the byproduct of a race of peoples who fucked their planet up so bad with nuclear war and destruction and hierarchy of power and these hereditary dictatorships. They fucked it up so bad they came down here to Earth did some genetic tinkering with existing things, created us, and have come down here and shut up, set up shop and fuck things up here on this planet so their progeny, us, as of the macrocosm, so the microcosm could fuck it all up again the same way they did. And that's what this book was, these writings and these tablets were supposed to be. A historical record of the people who put us here for the children of mankind, the future of mankind, so that we know, oh my God, this is what hey, God is here, and this is how we, what we need to do, take steps to not allow any of this to happen anymore. This is why they've given you religion and not this. This is why they've given you the Bible and not this. This is why they've given you the Quran and not this. This is why they've given you the Torah and whatever else it may be and not this. Because could, religion could never be about setting yourself free, could it? No, it's got to be about control, and it's because it came from these people. I mean, this... Have you ever watched the sun go down And you're thinking about the world spinning round Never been high as fuck You're in the bathroom mirror talking to yourself And your dog's looking at you like you need help Have you ever been high as fuck? Then you feel your heart pumping really fast And you're convinced that you're gonna have a heart attack Have you ever been high as fuck? Close your eyes and you're on a chicken farm The only problem's that the chickens have human arms You say that's fucked up, why do the chickens have human arms? You need snacks so you walk to the corner store But you're scared because you think that they will know you're high So you walk around the block to buy some time Go in the store But you're so high You don't know why you're there anymore So you just buy a pack of gum Get the hell out of there You're walking home And your mouth is dry You should have bought some juice and snacks But you were too high Thinking about ketchup chips some reason the game Battleship. You start thinking about how fun it was to play games like Battleship when you're a kid, and how as we get older we forget how to play and just to enjoy ourselves. So you say, guess what, I'm gonna make up a game right now, and it involves a baseball bat and a porcupine, and I'm gonna try to kill a porcupine with a baseball bat, but then you don't know where to find the porcupine, so you go on eBay and you do a search, but people don't sell porcupines on the internet. And you say, you know what, world? You got me cornered again. I'm going to roll another joint. You ever eat a whole bag of crackers that was so old that they weren't crispy anymore? Have you ever been high as fuck? Now this is the account of the first city of men and of kingship on earth. Now, very interesting how those things go hand in hand. The Anunnaki playing a hand in being, uh, setting up the first city of men on earth, and then 
also setting up kingships. And that's uh, that's what I've been trying to tell people here for here for four years on the show now is that, and it's an absolute fact if you do the research, the idea of kingship and the divine right to rule and all of this stuff, and it's very much alive in today's uh, politics and today's rulers and leaders. All of that, the whole idea comes that comes of that goes back to those families and those bloodlines who who trace their uh, lineage directly back to these Anunnaki, and that's how the kingship and the thrones and all this stuff were set up on Earth. So. Let's get into that here tonight. And how Marduk schemed to build a tower wherefore Inanna had stolen the M.E.s in the first region, in the lands of the Eden, and in the cities with precincts by their Anunnaki lords, the earthlings were taught handiworks and crafts. Before long, the fields were irrigated and on canals and rivers, boats soon sailed. The sheepfolds and granaries were overflowing. Prosperity filled the land. Ki in Gi, land of the lofty watchers, the first region was called. Then to, the, to let the black-headed people, a city of their own possess, it was decided. Kishi, scepter city it was called. In Kishi did the kingship of man begin. Therein, in consecrated soil, Anu and Enlil, the heavenly bright... Uh, in, in, now, this is interesting. Therein, in consecrated soil, Anu and Enlil implanted the heavenly bright object. Now, isn't that interesting? So in consecrated ground, Anu and Enlil are implanting some heavenly bright object into the ground here. Well, what could that be? Because whatever it is, it, that is, it has to do with kingship on the divine right to rule. Is this some ancient archaeological relic like the Ark of the Covenant? I don't know. In it, Ninurta appointed the first king. Mighty man was his royal title. My, that was the best they could do, mighty man. Mighty man, you are in charge. Run things for us here on this planet, mighty man. We trust you, mighty man, all the descendants of mighty man. <laughs> to make it a civilized center for mankind, Ninurta journeyed to Eridu. The Emmy tablets that for kingship divine formulas hold from Enki to obtain properly attired. With respect, Ninurta entered Iridu for the Emmy of kingship, he asked. Enki, the lord who all, uh, who all the Emmys, who safeguards all the Emmys, granted 50 Emmy to Ninurta. Mitochondrial extractions, DNA to create new, new workers, new humans. In Kishi, where the black-headed people were taught to calculate numbers. Heavenly Nisaba writing, uh, writing taught them, and Heavenly Ninkashi showed them beer making. Well, they showed how so beer came from aliens. Huh? All right, that's good to know. In Kishi, by, uh, guided by Ninurta, kiln work and smithing proliferated. Wheeled wagons harnessed to male asses. Craftily fashioned in Kishi. Laws of justice and righteous behavior were promulgated in Kishi. It was in Kishi. All the while, Inanna in the Unki, her lordship awaited in the third region. All the while, the domain of her own of the leaders she demanded. The third region after the second one will come, her leaders thus assured her. Having seen how Ninurta journeyed to Iridu and how the EME of kingship he attained, Inanna devised a plan in her heart to obtain ME from Enki. She schemed. Her chambermaid, Ninurshbur, she dispatched to Iridu to announce a visit by Inanna. On hearing this, 
Inky, Inky quickly gave instructions to his housemaster, Izumut, the maiden, all alone, to my city. Is directing her step to Aridu. When all alone she will arrive, let her enter into my inner chambers. Uh oh. You know what Inky's thinking. He wants to <laughs> pour the semen in the womb, pour it, pour it into her open vagina, pour the semen into her womb, Inky. It is your. It is your destiny to pour the semen into the womb. Pour for her cold water to freshen her heart. Give her barley cakes with butter. Prepare sweet wine and fill the beer vessels to the rim. Oh, yeah. See, that's worked for thousands of years. It, all, it all works and always works. Get her drunk and then take her panties off. Inky knows what's up, man. I mean, he knows the rules. He knows what he, you know, he knows what he's got to do. He's a pimp. When Anana was alone in the abode of Inky, entered, Izumud followed Inky's commands. Then, when Inky greeted Anana, he was overwhelmed by Anana's beauty. With jewelry, Anana was bedecked. By her thin dress, her body was revealed. When she bent down, her vulva, her vulva was thoroughly admired by Inki. I can't believe I just read that. When she bent down, her vulva was thoroughly admired by Inki. Oh yeah, I like that vulva, baby. I can see it sticking out of your dress. Christ. So these, so we got Anunnaki going commando now, huh? Now I like these guys. They're fucking Klingons all the way. These, they're fucking Klingons. Oh, these motherfuckers are hardcore. They're getting drunk, wearing no pants, eyes. She's running. She's rolling in commando, dude. I mean, vulvas, dude. When you got vulva sticking out of your dress, I mean, <laughs> come on now. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're pretty much asking for it there. I mean, you know, you, seriously, you're going to roll up, you're going you're to come over to a dude's house. You're going to have alcohol. You're going to have a dress where you can see your vulva. And you're going to expect that this dude is not going to want to get his dick wet. I mean, come on. Give me a fucking break. You got, you got to be expecting that. Come on, ladies. You wouldn't roll over to a guy's house with a dress on, with your vulva sticking out of it, unless you were planning on getting some, would you? All right, well, I'll keep that in mind. Next time I see a lady walk my way, if I see her vulva sticking out of her dress, it's on. That's all I'm saying. I can't believe it just read that. When she bent down, her vulva was thoroughly admired by you. Like, it's like he's standing there, you know, stroking his, his goatee or stroking his beard, you know, admiring it. Oh, I see your vulva sticking out of your dress there, huh? Oh. I'm just admiring it. Don't, don't mind me. I just, I, I just want to stare at it. Ladies, you know you got a guy that's full of shit if he ever tells you that. That the people composed hymns of praise to Ninurta. Sounds like the beginning of goddess worship right there, doesn't it? Of his heroic deeds and victories, they sang. Of his awe-inspiring blackbird, they chanted. I think it's interesting that they had this craft, you know, Ninurta has this craft called the Blackbird, this, you know, this ship that flies around, looks like a Blackbird. Could that be, could that be where we got the technology for the SR-71 Blackbird? I mean, look at that, look at that plane, look at the SR-71 Blackbird, think about that thing. They admitted they had that thing in 58, which means they had to have been working on it prior to 58, if 58 is when they admitted they had it. Yet this is long before computer-aided design and, and engineering and any of this stuff, yet they were able to calculate properly how to have this plane operate without a vertical fin stabilizer. It has two small fins in the back, but no vertical fin stabilizer. And I've seen documentaries talking about the SR-71 Blackbird where they're talking about, you know, that, and they, but they never seem to mention that, yeah, they didn't, you know, you would have had to have computer-aided design and all that stuff to get that right. How are they able to get that right? We went from flying, you know, prop planes just a few short years earlier 
in World War II to having, you know, this supersonic thing that can fly at the threshold of space in, in, in a matter of less than 10 years. So I find that interesting. I mean, could that SR-71 Blackbird come as a result of, you know, these ancient plans they found? Very well, it could have been. They've tried to retire those things so many times, but that they can't because there's still the stuff that's in them still surpasses technology we can produce today. The U-2 spy planes the same way. Why is that? Why is there technology in these things from 40, 50 years ago we can't recreate today? That's, that, that's a good question, isn't it? How in faraway lands the bisons were subdued and how the white metal was mixed with copper, he found. Ninurta's glorious time it was. With the constellation of the archer, he was honored.